The topic of managing stakeholder expectations actually came from people in one of our seminars at PMI who, when we asked them what would be a topic that they would like to deal more with, this one came out. So that's what I really want to share with you today. Uh, a lot about what it takes to manage expectations and what it takes to be successful in all the projects that you're doing. Uh, there's a treasure chest of ideas and best practices out there. What uh, we want to try to do is instead of keeping it closed, let's open it. You might have questions and be able to wonder what does it take, or or maybe you've been on a plateau where you've, you've trained on some technical profession and now wondering what it's going to take to advance in your career. And I think it's opening that treasure chest to realize it is all about people, working with people and managing their expectations, because if we don't do that, it's going to be real challenging to be successful. So what I'd like to do today is to focus on some of the skills, some of the attitude, high priority action items. And this is what it's all about. If we're, if we're leaders in whatever profession or project uh, work we're doing, we want to create excellence in the people and the processes and the working environment in which you're at. So what I'd like to help put into your toolkit is to, how to identify and of course manage or especially even the lead, your stakeholders. What are their needs? What are their motivations and their expectations? Because a lot of those things aren't always clear and we need to really take the extra effort to focus on those relationships with other people so that ultimately what it amounts to, you can achieve greater results, not only on yourself, because if you're in project manager or being a leader of any sort, you need to work with people. People are going to make the difference in how successful you can be and how the outcomes will add value in your work environment and to your clients or customers. We all have challenges. What are some of the ones that, uh, uh, let me just highlight a, a couple of them here. There's a lot of failures in organizations because of budget, schedule overruns, trust is lacking, a lot of dissatisfied customers. And why is that? Because a lot of times leaders do not address people's needs. You've probably heard the expression, people join a company for the organization and they leave because of their manager. And that is so true. I've seen it over and over again. I have a lot of students who I ask them to write about how a change has happened or how the organization is running. And there's still a lot of bad managers out there in spite of all the, the technology, the learning, the uh, project management institute, the certifications or whatever training that you have. Uh, there's a lot of people who have gone through their careers where they didn't pay attention to the people and they're still in positions of power. So that's what we have to deal with in many of our cases uh, in, in our organizations. The other challenge is that a lot of stakeholders don't really voice what their expectations are. They don't make it clear, or maybe they're very unclear about what they are. And you know what, what's gonna be really challenging is that we have a lot of unmet expectations or a lot of unexpressed expectations. And that's what's going to be real challenging. Uh, just even a personal example, I think uh, uh, in my my first marriage, I had a, a a person who had a lot of expectations that I didn't know what they were, and of course, I failed in in meeting them. And it's like, whoa, okay. So it, it really brought home the importance of being able to surface what the expectations are and uh, make them as clear as you can be. What you're also gonna find is that some people just rely on political correctness uh, to conceal their real motives. Maybe their motives is something very personal or very illegal or hidden agendas. All those kinds of things are out there. And those are the things that are going to be problematic if you're trying to realize that a lot of these stakeholders do have some power over what happens in your organization. And so a lot of times you might react in a certain way and you don't have a strategy about how you're going to deal with the people or how you're going to get everybody on board with what it is you're trying to do. Those are some of the cha challenges that we all face in going forward. So what's needed? I think uh, most of us are going to say 
Our expectation in our organization is improved project performance. There's still a lot of failures in a lot of projects that don't meet their budget or their schedule or, or the um, resources are inadequate. So what uh, I'm proposing is that when we manage stakeholder expectations, even if we have to scale back the project or heaven forbid, or maybe even a good thing, even to cancel some projects because they're, they're going to fail on their own or the market has changed or your client has changed their mind. A lot of those things we need to try to, if we're going to fail, let's fail early. Or if we're going to cancel, let's cancel early before we send, spend a lot of resources on things. But we really want to try to improve our success rate on all the projects that we're doing. So what's the imperative? Clear understanding of who these individuals and the groups are. You know, we want to know where are their expectations? Where, where are their interests? A lot of times in, in one of the uh, tenets of negotiations is to separate interests from positions. And position is saying what they're maybe demanding or what they want. But what are their real interests that can be met? And maybe it's a compromise that you can find because you can meet their interests, which are most important to them, and get past just what positions are. So you want to find out what those interests are, what their expectations are, what is their definition of project success? And so that's what we're trying to do is how can we then effectively manage those expectations? And it's going to take a lot of dialogue, right? Okay, so let's put a, a couple definitions out there. A stakeholder. Here's a list. Maybe it's your customer sponsor, performing organization, the public. These are your persons, your organizations. They're actively involved in the project and their interests may be positively or negatively affected by execution or completion of the project. And how it could be negative is that by assigning resources to your project, they can't be used on their project or some of their vested interests. And so there's a, a, a lot of uh, scarcity, if you will, of resources that if it's going to go towards your project, other people are not going to have it in theirs. Those are some ways that they might be able to sabotage or almost subversively put your project down because of their other interests or so forth. So we need to be aware of that in, in moving forward and, and, and get some commitment from these people because they can exert influence and in what you can deliver. So the stakeholder identification, we're going to go through the identification and then to the analyzing and, and come up with an implementation, you know, the process. And I'm hopeful that if you don't already have a process of, of doing your stakeholder management, that you'll, after this session, be able to say, well, yeah, maybe I give that a try. Okay. So you identify all the people, organizations who are going to be impacted by the project. Document, and we're going to talk about a stakeholder register, the relevant information regarding what those interests are, what their involvement are, and the impact on project success. And hopefully you have a sponsor assigned to each of your project. Are they involved from the beginning to the end of the project? A lot of times sponsors will be excited at the beginning. It's a glamorous project. And once it gets into execution, they kind of lose interest or move on to something else that's more interesting to them at that point. And their support for your project may wither or not get all that you need. So those are some things that you want to ensure that that involvement will be there from the beginning to the end of each and every project. Identifying your stakeholders. You wanna seek some help if you don't know all the people already. A variety of sources to identify so you can assess who are your stakeholders. Here's, here's a, a, a list of some of them that you may not yet have considered. And, you know, what support do you have from the top of the organization, from senior management? Do you have all the team members that you need to be involved? Or maybe other areas of the organization may not even know that your project exists or understand what the project is or why they should be involved. That's going to take some selling and some influence and negotiating skills many times to get to those 
other areas to ensure that you have full support and everybody understands what you're doing, why you're doing, and how you're going to do it. And then you might have some project managers who have some previous experience or some mentors that could help you through what you're trying to do. You obviously might have some subject matter experts if you're doing technical projects. These are people who are the R&D or the uh, people with the most technical expertise. Sometimes uh, they're lacking some of the people skills and or even communication skills. So it's going to take a lot of times to, to draw them out and make sure that they uh, are doing the things that will help support what your project needs to be. A lot of times, I know that the Project Management Institute, maybe some of you attended the, the conference that was held last month in Las Vegas. There's a lot of networking that can happen there where you can hear from the, from the speakers, but also with other attendees and be able to talk with them. We did a seminar for four days uh, with Alfonso from Spain, and a lot of networking happened at the tables. We put them in individual tables to learn from each other. And in some cases, we had some very experienced people, and other times we had some new people. And it's amazing to see how much they learn from each other and be able to come away with possibly some changed thinking about how to proceed. So if you're not part of PMI, if you are into project management, I highly recommend it and take advantage of some of the chapter events where you can do some of these uh, learnings. Or, uh, one of the things I enjoy being a seminar leader for PMI training is uh, networking with the other seminar leaders. We went out to dinner a couple times and, and at lunchtime and, you know, I might be having this difficult exercise or a person or uh, something came up that, yeah, how, do, how would you handle something like that? And it's just amazing how much we learn from each other. So those are some things that you want to take advantage of as you're being able to look around. Some other sources that you might be able to think about in terms of being able to find who your stakeholders are. You can look at your project charter. Hopefully you have one for each of your projects that you're doing. And it really is a formal document and hopefully it's very complete. It provides the authority that you get the support you need. Another place to look is the organizational charts. These are things that can show who's where in the organization. Doesn't necessarily show who has the power because sometimes they're either not on the chart or maybe they're not even at the top or in the leadership role, but yet by the nature of their personal skills and influence, they guide the organization. There's a book by uh, Art Kleiner, Who's the Boss? And, you know, I think he said, uh, customer is number eight. What? I thought customer is number one. Well, he says one through seven are really the key people in the organization. Maybe they're the part of the founders. Maybe they're, they're the people who are um, key in putting it together and make all the key decisions. And if they're not supporting something, it, it doesn't happen. And so if you do want something to happen, you need to make sure you know who those seven most influential people are. You can start with the organizational chart, but you might have to kind of look who, who whose desk is busy, whose calendar is hard to get into, who do people go to when they have questions and, and need some approvals. And then you also can look at some of the historical information. You might have a reservoir or knowledge base of uh, lessons learned from previous projects or other people who might have done projects in the organization in the past. If you're new to your organization, tap those people who have done projects in, in the past and say, you know, who did they have to work with and uh, where did they miss connecting with somebody and it later came to, to hurt their advancement and they, they had to recover from that. So those are some areas that you can look to. Another way is to look at your stakeholder compass. Uh, look at all the points in your, in your compass. Look to the north, the management chain. South, if you have some direct reports. And you've got the east and the west who are really other areas in the organization. Try not to miss anybody in, in this compass. And that's the question I keep asking on all the projects that I've done. 
who else do I need to include? And uh, that's not a one-time question. As you go through any project or any activity, you want to keep asking that, okay, maybe something changed. Maybe somebody proposed either a specification change or um, a new product or a new approach or new technology. Who else do I need to include to understand how we should proceed and move forward to that? And you want to keep referring back to these points and being able to realize uh, your stakeholder register needs to be as complete as can be. When I was at HP, we did a, a very large OEM proposal for a, a key customer. And I think by the time I was through with it, I identified 80, 85 people who were involved in this at one point or another and was able to get their involvement up front and thank them after the end of the project. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't happen and people appreciate it. Even if their involvement was even minor or major, they all know how it went and what they uh, what their contribution was and their, that it was appreciated. So talking about appreciation, uh, part of your assessment can be looking at these circles here. In the middle is really where you have more control. And I use that term loosely, control, because ultimately control is an illusion. You never fully have control of everything on your project because there are so many forces in our universe that are well beyond our control, whether it's uh, something that happens in the economy or something that happens, say, from a terrorist attack or um, pandemic. All these things are certainly beyond our control, but the ones closest to you are the ones that you can have maybe some more direct influence. You may not always have these people who report to you directly, and, and so you, you have to influence them rather than think you control them, but you have pretty good knowledge, hopefully, about who these people are and what they're contributing to your projects. Now, there's some others who you have some influence over. This is in your organization, your external stakeholders. All these things are gonna be involved in co-producing your outcomes, not just your outputs, your deliverables, but the business outcomes. So those people you can influence to some extent by being clear, by asking them what it is they need, documenting their interests, what their expectations are, and being able to, if you realize that their expectations might be different from what you've been charted to do on your project, you wanna find that out. And I found that out in one project. I was asked to do something and I, so I realized when I, really contact a lot of the key stakeholders that if I proceeded in that way, I would have failed. So I modified what the project was, but I went back to the originator, sponsor of it and said, you know, this is what I think we need to change how we approach this project. Do you agree? And yes, he did. And so we went on and we were very successful. So you can influence those people through your actions. It, take some discovery and take some follow through. And then finally, we have those people who we can just appreciate, the rest of the organization and the environment which you're at. You, you, your control is very minimal if it's non-existent. Your influence can be somewhat or not, but you just have to appreciate that these things are happening and be aware of them. These are things that would go into risk register. If you do your good risk management planning, all these things are one you wanna put into place here to realize you wanna have early warning if somebody in your appreciation circle is, uh, or something is happening in the environment, you wanna be able to appreciate that, okay, it's happening and we're good to go. Our purpose and our charter is, is still okay or not. Maybe we need to change it. Maybe we need to modify. Maybe we need to pull back or postpone. Is the time right to keep going with this project? Because even though, you know, I have an engineering degree from my undergraduate. The thing about engineers, we want to get things done. When we're working on something, we want to get it done. And many times in the, in the world of doing projects or products, getting it done is no longer the right thing to do because of, of the changes. So you want to appreciate when those things are happening 
and and then take some leadership role to be able to go through and determine how shall we do it because nothing is you know nothing is solid change is always happening okay stakeholder analysis we we tried to we talked so far about identifying who your stakeholders are let's look now at what we do in terms of analysis what are some things that we need to do and what you really want to do it's the word focus i want to highlight that word focus your analysis understand their interests and their expectations and appreciate what power or influence each of these stakeholders can exert across your entire project life cycle so those are things that to uh, build upon being as thorough as you can various salience models i'll share with you a couple of them uh, ways to characterize or describe the classes of stakeholders and things like their power their urgency their legitimacy you know how well are they viewed as a as a leader within the organization i'll share some of those ideas with you and i really do want to emphasize the time spent doing this analysis you might want to just get on with it get her done but take the time be patient in terms of being able to go through this because the more time you spend understanding the people and their expectations and coming up with a vision for the project and a purpose statement these are all tasks well worth spending more time on and getting them because once you do have them nailed things execution can go really smoothly okay uh when i was at hp in sales development i hosted a lot of customer visits these are people that wanted to come and and talk to some of our key people or see where the product direction was going and maybe they had some issues with our product and so forth so i really had to spend time with the sales rep to say what are their objectives in coming to palo alto or, or cupertino and being able to say you know who are they what level are they in their organization and my job all in advance was to match all their expectations and objectives with what we could share with them and who are the right people to do that and i was just amazed so many times you know you know a lot of visits don't always go you know smoothly but most of them all did because i could almost just sit back and watch and just see it unfold perfectly because we've got the right people talking with the right people who have the right answers and so that time spent up front meant we had very very few hiccups along the way so analyzing your stakeholders you want to look, kind of look at their interests their expectations and their power and influence let me share a couple points in each one of these what's in it for them what's in it for that person you know that's where a lot of their interests are going to surface you know what what are they trying to do is it that they are trying to meet some metrics get some things done sooner get a certain thing or a new technology or be able to meet a customer commitment a client commitment okay that's one of some of their interests that might be for a sponsoring or organization might be interested in profitability and, and cutting costs and increasing revenue but sometimes maybe in a more public uh, government thing they might be only interested in the impact they'll have on the public you know cost and schedule sometimes aren't as key an issue as it is just keep us out of the newspaper as you know a failed project you know that might be some of the interest so by knowing these things up front their definition of success is going to give you the marching orders and you're forewarned about what those interests are and many times it may not be exactly in the project charter to meet some of those interests but if you know that those stakeholders that's the most important thing to them that can change what you do or where you put some attention throughout the whole project moving on to expectations what do they expect or assume for your project a lot of assumptions might be made that uh, they heard a term or, or just heard a high level view of it and they have some assumptions about it you want to take the time to meet with them and explain the project 
because you know it probably better than anybody else. And they might have just made some assumptions about it. So you want to take the time to ask the question what they expect. And so you can anticipate what's required of the team and put your planning accordingly in, in place for being able to deal with those kind of things. And this is the, this is the biggie. This is why I'm even focusing on this topic. Unknown or unexpressed expectations can ruin your project. I can almost guarantee it. There are a few things I can guarantee, but that's probably one of them. So if you don't know what they are or they, for whatever reason, they didn't express it because they didn't have the opportunity, perhaps. So the thing that I've made a point in every project I've done is to talk to as many stakeholders as I can to ensure that their expectations are in alignment. And I found early on when we put some, even some draft documents out, and I got some feedback that says, you know, if we do this, we're going to fail. Or, you know, I had an email that was really long. And so I thank the universe for that wonderful gift. Now I know what it's going to take to get that person's support or that organization. We went to work on those things that we got as feedback, went back and closed the loop. Okay, this is what you said. Here's what we did about it. Here's what you said. Here's what we did about it. Anything else you would add to your list? No, I think you've covered it all. And the next step is a very important one too. Will you now support this project? Will you make an explicit commitment to support this project? Yes, and we are very successful. But if we had proceeded based on unknown or unexpressed expectations, wouldn't have been the same good outcome. Power and influence. You want to be sensitive to the power and influence each stakeholder has. And um, Jeffrey Pinto, in his Power in Politics and Project Management, used the term a, pro a political plan. And he didn't define it, so I've actually put a template together. I'm not going to cover that today, but it is available to download from, from my website. But the key point is that with regards to power, you don't want to be naive about who has the power and become a victim of politics. You also don't want to become a shark who really just runs over everybody else. And the term you want to do is be politically sensitive to the power and politics that are going on in any organization. Who are the people who have the power? Who doesn't? Who has the influence? Who through their very words can just turn things around or if they don't like something, it's going to in infect everybody else to not like it, okay? So you wanna be sensitive to those aspects of what's going on in any organization. And where does it come from, their power and influence? The availability of the resources, they might be resource of functional managers who can either allocate or not the people to your project. They control funding and or quality. It might be quality department or people who um, have to meet regulations or environmental or safety or a lot of diversity, inclusion. Those are all big terms right now. Social responsibility, who are the stakeholders in the public who might be uh, not liking what your project is going to do for the environment. Okay. And customer relations is another one that. Um, can say you might have customers or even competitors who are going after the same customer. So who are the ones that in, in place? So the whole point I'm trying to say is pay attention to the clues that are all around you, how they will impact a project. What language do they use? What are the questions? What are their actions? And there's a lot of clues that people give about something that if, if a, a, a tech support manager who's doing the documentation says, we want it to be world-class. Oh, okay. We know that that person cares about excellence. And uh, they might have had occasions where the product is coming towards completion and they have to do the documentation, but R&D didn't give them their specs in time and so forth. You might be aware that this is a concern for them. 
So how do you get them to get involved earlier? Remind them of the problems they've had in the past. What were the consequences of those things that happened in the past that can be not happen because we're going to deal with them proactively? So language, words, actions. Uh, remember I, I said I worked with the culture anthropologist and uh, he talks about the question, do you want control or do you want results? And of course, everybody's going to say results. However, if you look at their actions many times, it really focuses around control. They want to know, they want to feel comfortable about, they have all the information, all the activities, they have all the reports the metrics that makes them feel in control. And sometimes that very controls can limit the results. I've written a paper on this, uh, control or results and the paradox. And you need to kind of realize sometimes you have to relax some of the controls because it's going to be so intimidating or really constraining people from doing their best work. So if you keep focus on results, and uh, Ralph Stacey, uh, managing the noble, talks about bounded instability. And many, much of our work in, in organizations or projects or whatever, it's chaotic, it's unstable, and there's a lot of stuff going around. You, you go through the forming, storming before you get to the army and then performing. So there's a lot of stuff going on that seems unstable. And people aren't comfortable with that until they try to put controls in place. And he says, let it be, but put some boundaries out there where when you get a report or you see the metrics or the schedule as well for the budget is going way beyond what it can be. Those are some boundaries that you then have to come in. And, and then you kind of look at a vector. Vectors, for my engineering days, has a magnitude and direction. And I kind of use that the same thing with regards to what's going on in your project. If you're going in the right direction, but the magnitude's not high enough, okay, gentle nudge to put it in place and try to get back on track. <clears throat> or it may be that the vector is kind of steering off. You're going in a different direction. And, and, and you know, let me use it, uh, try it this way. And what you might just kind of say, well, you have to get out two by four and kind of slap this thing back into place. So ebb and flow, realize there's some natural chemistry going on that you don't want to disturb and let it be, but also realize there's some boundaries between you're going to do some nudging or some more forceful action to try to get things back in, in, in on track. So the other question to keep asking yourself or your team members, who could stop this project? Not a one-time question. Keep asking that question, who could stop your project? Maybe you need to go talk to that person or organization. Maybe you need to make some modifications, make some changes. Perhaps, and this is also a strategy sometimes, go into stealth mode. If people know what I'm doing, they're not gonna like it or they're gonna try to stop me or redirect it. But you, you might know in your mind and, and you've got your key sponsor to realize, this is absolutely critical. We have to do that. But if we get our normal forces in play, it might paralyze what we're trying to do, get into endless discussion. So sometimes the stealth mode is a viable strategy that you can say, this is how we're going to proceed and, and, and then do a, a, a very good introduction where people can see how wonderful it's going to be. You may not, you may know that but they may not see that until they see it and, and then can believe how wonderful whatever it is you're doing, okay? So thinking about your stakeholders, let me share with you some guidelines, uh, some things about why, what, and how to do your stakeholder analysis. Of course, the why, what, and how are all critical. And if you haven't read Simon Sinek's work or seen his TED talk on start with why, it's very crucial. People need to know why you're doing what you're doing. And when they get the why in their minds and supporting and believing in it, then their support's gonna be a lot, lot better. So here's some guidelines. 
identify them, prioritize their values, and what issues they might have so that you are forewarned about them. Are there some competing or some other entries, uh, entities that he might either might detract or be in congruence and support what you're trying to do and, and give more impetus and weight to the thing you're trying to do? Be anticipatory about potential conflicts and allies. Alert yourself, team members, to the need for conflict resolution. I was working with one team and they were going pretty fine until a conflict came up. And what we really would need to do if that team needed to be a team, not only in name, but in real reality, they needed to have some training in conflict resolution, constructive contention. Some, some level of conflict is healthy. You wanna make sure it's positive and, it, and is healthy, otherwise it could be destructive. You also wanna design a process, align stakeholders with the goals of the project. Part of that's gonna be your strategy or what uh, way you communicate, what you do newsletters or uh, emails or phone calls. You know, what is the process that makes sure that the alignment is there in the beginning and stays there throughout any changes. And you wanna really optimize your time and that of stakeholders. Your time, I'm gonna say, put priority on dealing with the people issues, dealing with their expectations, their interests, more so than some specific task that you might be involved in. Early in my career as a program manager, out in the field to put a whole bunch of rooms of equipment together. And I had been the doer the technical expert uh, prior to that point. And I was still trying to do some of that. Uh, but then the customer would come and have a question or maybe our business manager called me and said, you know, Randy, can we uh, do such and such so we can get our billing done? And I had to stop working. I realized, you know, if I keep trying to do some of those technical tests, I'm going to be distracted. I'm going to be uh, have an interruption and I may fail at that. So I really realized my job had changed. I needed to work with the stakeholders. I need to, to anticipate what's going, to, what they're going to need for next week. I need to focus on the environment, not so much on just the task. Okay, so that was a, a point to realize my time emphasis shifts throughout the course of the project. And you want to be cognizant for your stakeholders as well. Another thing is to realize motivation. Expectations and motivations are actually somewhat different at times. And you really wanna to get to the core of what is important for people. You know, what are their needs? The first point is being able to understand, understanding what, what are they lacking? You know, it could be physical, emotional, physiological, even an affiliation, okay? And so once you kinda of know what their needs are, you want to kind of create the drive that they feel compelled because your vision or your why statement is so compelling that they are driven within them to move from a dissatisfaction state to one of satisfaction, right? So then, you know, what is the goal-oriented behavior that you want to try to do? do you know, you want to be able to say that they their behaviors uh, are very upper level behaviors that are very supportive of a, maybe of a set point, or, you know, it, it could be that they have lower level behaviors, where, which are very, very distractive, distract, distractions from the teamwork type of thing. So you want to try to reinforce, you know, every time you find something, doing something positive, reinforce that. And sometimes, oftentimes we, we feel compelled to deal with the negative and behaviors that are detrimental. And a lot of times that person has, it's, it's been a, um, a very disruptive discourse and very degrading or, or demotivating for people. But when they get reinforcement, when they do good things, we all like that feedback and that reinforcement. When they did something good and people notice it, they're going to do more of that. Sometimes the negative behaviors can just fall for the wayside. So don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive, reinforce it. Appreciative inquiries, the whole discipline around that, where you really discover what 
individuals and organizations do well and keep building upon those. Because how do you get extraordinary behavior and extraordinary results from average people when they're working in their strengths and they're all working and their behaviors are supportive? That's how you get extraordinary results. Okay. So then you want to be able to know that people will perform the task and they get the feedback on it. And then you really have to sometimes might have to re reassess the motivation. It all boils down to this. You might be trying to provide external motivation with rewards and consequences. Those are possible. But the key driver is going to be their inner motivation. Pay attention to what they are. Seek clues. Search it out. Ask the questions of people. I've worked with a lot of very smart engineers. And even they get very emotional or very energetic at a certain point when they start talking in a certain way. So I try to trigger, you know, and I pay attention. When do, when does their energy level pick up? When when do they get more animated? Okay, those are some things that you can really understand that when when people are uh, being motivated, and that's what you want to tap. You want to reinforce those type of things. Here's a sample stakeholder register. And this is a salience model where we kind of talk about what is their power and their level of influence. And the power could be how much they have influence over other people and do they have direct control of resources. And that you can have a score and you can have a weighted score. And then their level of interest. Is it a technical interest or a social interest? And then their x-axis score, you can weight those. And, and the worksheet, again, is available at my website. It's a... Excel spreadsheet you can download defines, you know, you, and you can even change the weighting of technical or social. And then the Z axis is the third level where you kind of said, how supportive or resistant are they towards this project? And I give a higher score towards resistance because you, you want to get that attention uh, from it. And I'll show you uh, the bubble chart. And what the bubble chart can do is being able to see the bigger bubbles are the ones who have a higher resistance. This is a sample project that my colleague did. And you can kind of see where all the individual stakeholders can, can appear somewhere in their interest and their power. And <clears throat> those people who are up and to the right are going to be your most powerful stakeholders. You know, and if you get some that have a lot of power, but their interest is a little bit low, like that one blue dot, oh, it's going to take a little more work to kind of see how do I move, move that person a little bit uh, more to the right? Because that, that's where you like to be in order to have a higher probability of success on your project. And so you can see on the right-hand side where you can then start putting in a little bit more information. What are their interests? You know, ambitious, want the project to succeed, or the the colleague is the technically, but uh, they challenge and, and, and they're big on early adopting new technologies. What's their assessment? What's their impact? You know, if they're widely respected or do they tend to avoid people? And then you can kind of say, what's my approach going to be? This is where I take action. And being able to say, do I need to do some one-on-one -on -one meetings? Do we need to do them every week, once a month? Do they prefer phone calls, meet in person, read reports, go to a shareholder place where they can get all the details that they want, okay? Or, you know, with the technical person, the challenging assignment, give them some feedback, especially since they might be a little bit low on the social scale. And how do we get them uh, feeling that they're part of the team? Make them feel comfortable. Or, you know, sometimes you want to excuse them from some of the meetings because, you know, they're going to be bored or something like that. So those are some things that you might be able to, to, to think about how, how to approach them. And uh, what I like about using Excel for this is that bubble chart that you see here is something that you can uh, uh, really, by putting in the scores, can, can do the chart for you automatically. This is either a team or, or an individual exercise, depending how sensitive this information is. Even in a political plan, I, I talk about putting a political jungle together of who are the various uh, lions, tigers, and bears. And again, you need to be careful with some of those that you might offend some people or, or people can have fun with it. Depends a lot of times how your environment is, how open 
or what your culture is like. Be sensitive to that. Here's another salience model that kind of look at what is the level of agreement, high or low, that these individual stakeholders have towards your project? And what is your trust for them? Is it high or low? And up to the right is, this is the place you want as many people as possible. These are the allies, high trust, high agreement. On the lower right, these are your opponents. These are people that uh, may have a different agenda or different background. And I've worked with one colleague like that, that uh, our experiences and the way we thought and so forth are very different, but we had high trust for each other. And that made for a very high performing team. So the trust is crucial. And the term worthy opponent is good because these people challenge you to think differently. To, to take a different approach or to expand or change whatever it is you're doing, or maybe you turn them around. They can go either way. You want to be skilled in being able to do that with your influence and negotiating skills and selling skills. Okay. Now, if we go to the left side, this is the problem side because trust, if it's not there, these are the people who could undermine your project. And so you might have high agreement, but you, this stakeholder never fulfilled. It didn't follow through or you couldn't count on that person. And then the lower part is adversary, low trust, um, low agreement. Uh, this is the people that you need to, let me use the term, neutralize. They could really destroy your project if, if they have enough power. Or maybe they don't have a lot of power, but they still look kind of negative. Maybe that's when you just try to minimize the impact that they might have. How you deal with people on this particular chart is start from your position of strength. Say you're dealing with an opponent. You wanna say your strength is the trust that you've had from the past. And say, gosh, we worked together so well in the past. I'm looking forward to it again. Oh, by the way, I, I heard that you weren't quite on board with this particular spec. And then you start moving them up towards agreement on what you're trying to do or or you change what you're doing. And many times these people have really opened my eyes to something we were missing. And it was so good that, uh, that the agreement was there, but then we, by the time we really got into the execution, the agreement was there. So now if you shift to the left side, if you get those comrades where, where high agreement, you want to kind of build upon this thing, you know, I'm really glad that you're on board with what we're trying to do in this project. This is this is great. Oh, by the way, you know, in the past, we've had this concern where you didn't get all your deliverables on time, done on time. What can we do with that? And so you built that rapport. And then you try to start moving them uh, over a little bit more towards the right. And then with the adversaries, again, this is tough. You might have to really... Uh, uh, get some help from a third party to deal with th those stakeholders or ignore them or neutralize them. Or this is, you know, the more problem area that it's going to take a lot of creativity. And this is where you look those circles, you know, you can appreciate their, their power, their influence or, or lack of it and deal with it accordingly. So those are some things, some ways to try to, to, to deal with those, those aspects. How do you manage your stakeholders' expectations? Okay, communicate and work with them, meet their needs, address, address the issues as they arise. Okay, so here's some things you wanna utilize. We got a communication process. Have a communications plan and communications uh, register and how, how often you're going to communicate, what, what uh, means of communication, what's it, newsletters, emails, and so forth. Regular meetings are such where uh, my projects, I wanted to say we're going to meet every week. Well, we'll try to keep them short. And it's not just a status meeting because that's that's kind of boring. Do the status checking offline and directly and come together with those regular meetings to say, what are the issues that we now have in place there? And, and who do you need help with? Or how do you get some clarification on what, what is the meaning of the specifications? You've got all the technology available to you, the emails, the web, newsletters, 
and social media, if, if you will. You also want to track the issues. And one of the things when I was a uh, release manager for releases of our new operating systems at, at HP, uh, I had a person to be my coordinator who Stephanie could track uh, or, or get all the data and, and progress and specifications for our master schedule, because this was a big system. And so she could gather that so I could spend the time to deal with the issues as they arise, if we really needed to communicate or, or find some people who are being uncooperative, that's where I could do it. And you also want to administer some change control. This is where a lot of organizations have made it so onerous that people will avoid it as everything they possibly can. And that may be detrimental because you might need to do some change. So you want to make sure it's done very uh, proactively, people are communicated, people have a way to administer or, or to submit some proposed changes. People review it, look at the impact. Once it uh, is approved or rejected, everybody knows what's going on. Those are some things you want to do in communications with your stakeholders. Interpersonal skills, let's look at a few of those. Trust, I talked about the importance of that. You can't build trust directly. What you can do in you know, under your purview is to be trustworthy. You do what you said you're going to do. You're authentic. You act with integrity. If you committed to certain things, you always meet it. If things are going wrong, they know that they can count on you to share that, all the bad news as well as the good news. You want to resolve conflicts in a very positive way. And like you said, some conflict is healthy. And it all boils down to listening to the other side. Listen to what people are saying. Um, the wisdom of crowds, being able to listen. And you know, if, if you've uh, uh, read that book, it, it talks about how even a, um, uh, not a team of experts, it's, the, the dream team is not always the most productive. If you get a diverse audience who are independent and you, <clears throat> a way to aggregate all their inputs, and by listening, that's where you can come out with some very key support. When I've done some consulting engagements, I've been given a, a presenting challenge. And the first thing I always wanted to do was interview a cross-section of the people. And my firm belief is the people close to the action know what the answers are, what needs to be done. But nobody asked them. I might be the first person that ever asked them what to do. And then I become the aggregator, aggregator so I can aggregate all this information back and present it to the powers that be and try to put that in place to, to make some changes or improve their operating conditions. You want to vocalize your expectations of people. When we we're having some people who are going to be reviewing issues, I wrote out expectations that I would have of them that every day they would go to that website and look at what's been posted for that day. And if there's nothing there of interest to them, fine, move on. But if they care about it, voice their concerns. Also, when we came to the point to vote on what solution to go with, their point was to say, once a vote has been posted within 24 hours, you need to post your vote. And <laughs> one of the techniques I used to say, you know, if you don't vote or if you don't speak up, we're going to pick the thing that's the worst outcome for you. It gets their attention. And that's very important. And I want to be able to try to do that. Okay. And all of this comes down to negotiating. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics. It's one of my favorite modules in my seminars, even at workshops I do on negotiating. It's a key skill. I think it was over 30 years ago, I did a negotiating course and it changed my life. This is a, um, excuse me, a skill that you would use every day. It's a career enhancing skill. So if you don't view yourself as a good negotiator, do something about it. Read a book, take a course, practice. And remember the negotiations with the spouse, with the child, with the boss, with the client, where you were able to come to a mutual agreement, build upon that and recognize you can do it, right? Management skills. What are some of the management skills? 
train and develop stakeholder skills. We talk about at the complete project manager whole molecule of what skills can be. And I've mentioned a few of them, your negotiating skills, your leadership skills, your, your negotiating, your change management, conflict resolution, and uh, your environment and, and political skills. So all of those things that, uh, and you might need to even train and educate your sponsor because a lot of them did not have a good understanding of project management when they went through that stage of their career. So you can train and develop all these people to be on board. And one of the reasons why they might want to be on your project is because they're going to learn better processes, better procedures. They're going to have fun. Right? So implement good processes in, in place there, especially if it's a scarcity in your organization or projects haven't been done well in the past. This is going to be, you know, there's a scarcity of good processes. I was speaking at a portfolio management conference and two of the speakers before me said, well, I'm not really a process person. So first thing I said when I got up, I am a process person. I fought fires in the past. I'm saying, I'm going to put a process in place so we don't have to fight that fire again. We can have new fires to put out, right? That's challenging. That's fun. That's, that's how we grow. Okay. So um, be visible. Make presentations, speak up, discuss, put put reports in place, speak truth to power, right? And there's no process for being able to do that. And all along, you want to be fair and consistent in what you're doing, that you are transparent in your motives, your expectations. You don't have any hidden agendas, that type of stuff that, that people realize if, if Randy said that's what's going to do, he's going to do it. I know he's, he's going to do it. Yeah. Okay. That's what you want to do. And you're fair, you're, you're including other people, you're asking their opinions, and, and when you don't always follow them, you close the loop, understand. And, and, and so they're going to be realize that you are being fair and being consistent. All right, it's time to validate. If you've done all of these type of things, there's some cautionary statements I want to put out here to say. Do not, do not assume your first pass through your stakeholder management process is correct, accurate, or feasible. The good first start, but you want to document the assumptions. Check them out, okay? Make sure that people are clear in what they're doing. Ask questions. Look for evidence that people are in support of what you're trying to do. Generalizations and stereotypes. You want to be careful of them. Stereotypes. We had a cross-cultural person come and speak to us, and I was actually surprised. She she talked about stereotypes are good. Normally, we kind of think, hey, don't stereotype me. You know, that's not fair. What she said is that stereotypes are such, especially when we're dealing with a new person, a new culture, a new country, or a different uh, geophysical <clears throat> culture. If you do some research about some of the stereotypes in place there, that gives you at least a baseline. You don't want to adhere to that thing, but you are aware of what the baseline is. And then you can see it's a starting point. You can see is a behavior consistent with that stereotype or very different? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, you're not locked into it. You're not assuming that. Look at the reality. Validate with reality. Review the plan with your project sponsor and team members. Okay, I said it could be an individual exercise, uh, but it's more valuable and more correct when other people agree with what's in place here and have had some input or, or maybe have given you some, some feedback that says, you know, could be improved if you do this or that. Update the plan when changes occur. You might also get some new stakeholders come in. These are some things that you might want to be able to realize that uh, it's not always perfect. It's not always going to stay the same, but it may be necessary to put it in place there. And have fun, all right? Getting to know everybody during the process. Starts with yourself. Make your decisions early. Manage those decisions. You know, nothing will make a better impression than your ability to manage yourself. And a lot of times, uh, 
A lot of times you don't want to make a decision because you don't have all the information. It's not perfect. Make it anyway and say, if as more information reveals itself and we need to change, we will assess that and possibly do so. So people know what it is you're doing, but at least a decision has been made and people can move forward. Okay. I've talked about where's your priority. Understand, listen to people, be a good example, and your positive attitude is going to be placed. A lot of things, a lot of the studies on influence is saying the more that people like you, they don't always have to truly like you, but respect you, the more they're willing to want to work with you, even if they have a different opinion. Okay. Cultivate relationships up, across, and down. This is part of who else could stop your project or who else do I need to get involved in the particular project? You know, who are the people who have been very successful in doing this type of activity that their the stakeholders always seem to work very well with them? Who are these people and how, what can you learn from them? All right. Uh, leadership effectiveness it, it, as well. And one of the things that uh, my students in my courses uh, often do, or even when I do seminars, we do in the table discussion. Who has been a leader who has impacted your career? Really positively, or maybe negative, but positive. And, and what leadership traits or, or what uh, stakeholder expectations traits did they do that you could not just mimic, but you can ad adopt, adapt, and apply? Adopt it into your belief structure, adapt it to your own way of working, and then apply it to get better results. Okay. You also have to be aware that you have biases. I have biases. What music I like, uh, what uh, type of things I like to do, um, what are my interests, what are my feelings, okay? These are some things that are going to impact a lot of what's happening out there as well. Know yourself, believe in yourself, take care of yourself before you can take care of others. Beware. This happened where was with the team and we were just all over the board with some of our discussions. And finally, when somebody went up to the board and put this ladder of influence in place, it became clear. We had all made some conclusions or beliefs, but what was the real observable data? So the ladder means you've got some observable data that might be captured on the camera. You know, what did the person actually say? What's the data? What's the report there? So. A lot of times what we do is we select data that supports our point of view, <laughs> all right? And you'll see that in buying a car, you know, what color car, what type of car. Once you kind of observe things, you'll say, yeah, I see a lot of those around, okay? Well, then we add meanings to what we've selected, whether it's cultural, personal meaning, what's it important to me? And then we make some assumptions based on meanings that I've added. Okay, and maybe it's somebody from the overseas partner who never responds to your request. Well, the data might have been two or three they didn't, but of all the 10, you've got a lot of them. But you start getting to an assumption, it's impossible to work with these people. And you draw conclusions uh, uh, about that, that I, I won't do that. And that becomes our beliefs. And then we take actions on that. And what happens is that I, as an individual, might climb this ladder. But what about the other people I'm dealing with? What have they done? They've climbed the ladder too. And is their ladder results the same as mine? Maybe not. Okay. So when I say beware, realize this is happening. We all do it. Okay. So how do we deal with it? Become more aware of your own thinking and reasoning. And make it visible to others. This is what was said by the manager, this is the data we have. And then inquire into other people's thinking and reasoning, okay? And one of the questions I can ask when somebody just makes what appears to me an outrageous statement, rather than get defensive, because defensive is not a good tactic, what in your experience led you to make that conclusion? And I might learn something about that person. Or I might find out they have something very valid, okay? So you're inquiring, and the point is that you wanna balance advocacy with inquiry. Advocacy would be, well, 
you really want to get on board with this project, don't you? Or inquiry might be, what will it take to get you on board with this project? Big difference. Focus on inquiry questions. Be very weary of advocacy questions, unless it is a point where you have to make sure that people understand your own thinking. Okay. Just a couple more things that uh, we'll, we'll deal with here. And um, organizational patterns. Okay, there's a, a, a lot of things in, in, in organizations that are patterns that uh, deal through, a way we deal with the chaos that's happening. Okay, relationships are important to everybody else. And people respond to energy and enthusiasm. They want to know that you believe in your project and you express your why with passion. Passion is your greatest tool in your toolkit. It doesn't mean you have to jump up and down and, and be dramatic, but it really needs, it needs to know that people can see that, that uh, you're putting energy behind this and uh, I want to follow you. Ask questions that engage others. Okay, make them think, open-ended questions. Use compelling evidence and vivid language to describe your vision and goals. So there's, it's clear, convincing, compelling, and, and concise. The vision statements many times aren't. And those are the three, four C's I put in place here. And, and you want to have a lot of vivid language that so people get it. Take the time to explain things. You want to create an organic ecosystem where people feel like this is a I like working here. It supports me the way I like to work. And the way I work is different from, you know, Tom down another cubicle type, but I can be myself and I'm appreciated for myself. We have psychological safety, which has been uh, researched to turn. That's where you get the highest performing team. Okay. And then explicit commitments when you're really trying to get people on board. We're almost hardwired if we commit to something we're going to be more likely to do it. Even if you don't have the authority, but you can ask them, will you commit? And if they say yes, you can hold them to it. Focus, trust, authenticity, and integrity. These are really key, valuable things. Where do people want to spend their time? Something that is of value to them, okay? They probably have a lot of multiple tasks going on that they could uh, deal with. And you want to realize what is important to them. Where do they see value? And what you want to do is close the gap between insight and value. They might have some insight about something, but not something that's value. It's going to add value to the marketplace or to your organization. How do you get others to choose to work with you and support the common goal? This question is more important than any one single answer. Keep asking this thing, and there are many, many answers. And you really want to say, what's a value to those other people that's going to, do we have a common value that we support? There may be things we might disagree upon, <clears throat> but those are outside the work of this project, right? So let's find the things we agree upon and support those, okay? So implementation. Ask open-ended questions. Create a test or prototype. People may not understand what you're doing until they can see it and see how it works. You may not do all the functions, but test the prototype. What if questions are one of the rules of negotiating that you can kind of say, well, what if you know we could do a subset of that in, in, in the time frame that you said, but not do all of it? You're not making a commitment. You're just trying to see what their reaction is. And, and ask a lot of what if type of questions that can really help you get in place there. Anytime you make some assumptions, test them. And stay tuned to changes because changes were going to be there. Okay, behaviors. Do you see all of a sudden a strange different behavior happening from somebody? You wanna be able to address what, what it is or understand what it is, okay? Your secret to success, make yourself more valuable, align with organizational goals. <clears throat> Part of your stakeholder management is attracting like-minded individuals who want to make a difference. Okay, when you get those people on board, it's like, wow, we can get extraordinary results here. 
form alliances with key stakeholders, get people on board, okay? Focus on people and relationships, the interactions. We're all hungry for those interactions, for more information. Ask people, and I pick, pick them down to one thing, not just meet scope, schedule, and resources. What is your definition of success? And it might be surprising, it might be simple, or it might be hard, but now you know. Integrate key skills from a variety of disciplines. This is what we talk about in our complete project manager. And this is Alfonso, my colleague. Take the initiative. One thing most importantly, be authentic, act with integrity, practice accountability. Authentic means you say what you believe. And anytime people know that you don't believe what you're saying, you've just lost it. Act with integrity means you do what you said you do, would do for the reasons you said. And I've seen some people just blow it and just suck the energy out of a team when they committed an integrity crime. It's not going to send you to jail, but it does have that negative impact because, you know, that's not what you said. That's what we are led to expect. People want to know that you, you have integrity. Accountability means you ask people to, to be responsible for the success of the whole. Can you ask that of people? Can you demand it? Yes and no. You can ask it. You can't necessarily demand it. But you can ask that even if you don't have the authority. Ask people, not only just do your task, but if you see something that's not right, please speak up and do something about it. We need you to use your all of your senses in place to contribute to this project. And behavior changes when you do that. Okay. Pulling this all together, tune in the essence of self and others. What's the most important thing to you? What's the most important thing to other people? What What is your essence? Are you working in your essence? Because if you have done stuff outside of your interests, you're not going to be a high performer. So what are the essence of others who, where they really want to make a difference? We have a lot of clues around us. Get them expressed so you're not suffering the unexpressed expectations. Build trust. <clears throat> you're viewed as competent and you're working for the greater goal. Get extraordinary results. And here's another one in case you don't practice this one. Have fun. Projects work. Everything should be fun because one answer to how do you get people to want to work with you? It's just more fun. You learn. You get a, you get extraordinary results. You're working in your strength. In the you're practicing your essence. Okay. One final reminder here. You hear a lot these days about artificial intelligence. Until it's available to capture words, action, beliefs, expectations, and motivation, it's up to us to do these things. We don't have a tool per se that's going to do it for you. I've tried to share with you some things that I thought would be helpful to manage stakeholder expectations. This is really uh, my contact information. These are some of the books that I've done, building upon the uh, Triangle from PMI about environment sponsors and project managers. The sweet spot is that green space where they intersect. That's your portal to achievement. Randy, thank you so much for presenting with us today. Thank you, Susan. It was my pleasure.